Good morning, I'm Kay Halasek from Ohio State University. I want to thank the conference and the SAO uh, for the opportunity to serve as the chair of the exemplar committee. And I also want to recognize the other members of that committee. I know a couple of them are here, if you would please stand. Shirley Rose from Arizona State University, Eileen Schell from Syracuse, Tony Scott from Syracuse, and Bronwyn Williams from the University of Louisville. Please join me in thanking these members of the committee. Many of us have our stories about Kathy Yancey. And regardless of where or when those stories took place or with whom, they share a common theme of generosity. Kathy's, in support of Kathy's nomination, Leanne Robertson wrote that she shepherds with great wisdom and empathy others' development as scholars, administrators, learners, and leaders in the field. In contributing as she has to the careers of students and her colleagues across the country, Kathy has shaped the profession. And for these contributions and the many, many others noted in the conference program, we recognize Kathleen Blake Yancey with the 2018 CCCC Exemplar Award as a person whose years of service to our organization represents the highest ideals of scholarship, teaching, and service to the entire profession whose record is national and international in scope, and who sets the best examples for the Four Seas membership. Please note that her remarks today will appear in a future issue of Four Seas. Please join me in congratulating Kathleen Yancey. Good morning. I begin with a bouquet of thanks. First, thank you to Bud Weiser, my dear friend and colleague, for nominating me and for inviting other friends and colleagues, fellow travelers Doug Hesse, Chris Anson, Erica Lindemann, and Leanne Robertson to join him. Thanks to each of you. Second, a thank you to the Exemplar Committee, to Kay Halisak, who chaired, and to Eileen Schell, Shirley Rose, Tony Scott, and Bronwyn Williams. My thanks to each of you. And a thank you, of course, to you, to the Conference on College Composition and Communication, some of us here this morning in Kansas City, others online, and others in absentia. Like those who came before me, I am honored and I am humbled. My story is a simple one. I began my rhetoric and composition doctoral program in the fall of 1977 after attending my very first four C's here in Kansas City. My doctoral dissertation, a schema-based study of the composing process. I began my teaching career as a TA in the writing classroom and never really left. Although I have also tutored in writing centers, taught in a professional communication program, directed both a uh, communication across the curriculum program and a rhetoric and composition uh, MA and doctoral program, where I currently study and teach with a dream team of colleagues and students. But my story, um, the story for many of us, is also another story. I believe in the cause. I'm not sure that I understood that what I signed up for was in fact a cause first as a teacher, then a researcher, and often an administrator. I mostly knew that I wanted to teach, and I knew that I wanted to teach writing, because regardless of the task, I knew that students would bring themselves into their writing. I thought that teaching students, learning with and from them, reading their work, and in the process reading them, would be interesting, affirming, challenging, exasperating, engaging, illuminating, would keep me alive for a lifetime. It has. This cause, however, is more than about my teaching. It's also about being part of something larger, something that expands and enriches what any one person does, what any one person can do. That's what the field, the discipline, has been for me. A group of colleagues and friends who help me learn, who make what I do matter, who make me smarter, who keep me focused and balanced, who help make what I do, what we do, meaningful. That doesn't mean that we always agree. We don't. 
But those disagreements, they provide an opportunity to see what has been invisible, to articulate the possible, ultimately to come to terms. The field, that cause, has changed over time. We've become more field-like, even disciplinary, with new questions, theories, and research emphases, new journals and organizations, a wide range of print and digital books, a major. In the process, we've also become recognizable as a field. And as someone who identified with the field, I saw forwarding it as a cause, as our cause, one that has brought me pretty much day in and day out, a kind of intellectual and material pleasure in the work, an abiding joy in writing, in teaching, and in researching. Writing, researching, and the teaching of writing we know are important, but in Medius race we forget they matter. Throughout this process of becoming, I've been able to learn, and there's always and still so much to learn about students, about composers, about composing. About students, at UNC Charlotte, I taught a non-traditional student who had taken our advanced writing class and failed, so he was back to make it right in my class. Writing didn't come naturally to him. Argument, he said, was especially difficult because in his culture, polite people didn't argue. But a flexible thinker and a hard worker, he was becoming a pretty good writer, on track to pass. Then, without warning, he disappeared. But, intrepid, he returned the next term, taking the same class with yet another colleague. And this time, he passed with a B, and he published a letter to the editor in the Charlotte Observer. Although this experience happened more than 20 years ago, I still wonder, what might I and we as teachers have done to help him pass that class the first time around? About composers, a writer whom I've never met but I feel I know is Yuri Kokuyama, a composer who by her own account loved to write. In 1942 in the Santa Anita reassembly camp, she invited four young Japanese American writers to join her, calling themselves the Crusaders, they wrote letters to Japanese American soldiers fighting overseas to remind them of loved ones at home, to boost their spirits, to demonstrate to others that they too were patriots in a time of war. Over the years, the Crusaders wrote to over 5,000 soldiers, created a junior Crusaders group to stuff envelopes, and used a mimeograph machine to print letters that became what they called mixed up newsletters. In today's parlance, Yuri created a network. I wonder about other print networks that composers have created, about what we might learn from them. About composing, networks also take digital form with affordances and constraints differing from those of their analog cousins. They too tell us about composing. The Women's March was launched with a Facebook post by a retired woman in Hawaii. Posters, plaques, and signs from the marches in 2017 and 2018 show up on social media, their individual and collective composings uh, enacting their cause. Never Again's a campaign against school massacres and forsaying gun control, inspired in part by Black Lives Matter, was created by a high school students whose experiences of school who have been, from their very first day in kindergarten, held hostage by the threat and the reality of violence. Never again, first a hashtag circulating on social media, now a movement prompting businesses to disavow the NRA and stores to suspend um, selling assault weapons, and students to stage a national walkout yesterday while shaming politicians into action. I wonder what these practices and their composers can teach us about the future of composing. There are those who think that this learning, this writing, this teaching is dangerous. I often tease my students that I'm trying to teach them enough to make them dangerous. And perhaps that that's what we do, and why it matters, in part, is precisely because it makes people dangerous, as they articulate ideas, speak to others, and create movements through composing. Recently, Rory Lee, one of my former advisees, now a colleague and friend, talked about this way of framing what I have called a cause. He says, what we do, that is, assist our students in knowing and doing with and through words is dangerous. I get reminded of that often, and I often remind myself that making students intellectually dangerous is an important and honorable pursuit. That pursuit, one which I share with you, 
has motivated, animated, and defined my professional life. I thank you for sharing this cause, and in so doing, sharing this Four C's Exemplar Award with me.